A Midsummer Night's Dream was written by William Shakespeare during the 1590s, around the time he was writing Romeo and Juliet. It is probably one of his strangest and most delightful creations, and it marks a departure from his earlier works and from others from the English Renaissance. Not for nothing is the Elizabethan age known as the Golden Age of England. It was not only prosperous from a sociopolitical perspective, but also from the literary point of view. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy that parodies the traditional love stories and dramas of Shakespeare's time. During the 16th century, the Italian Renaissance had a great influence throughout Europe, and England was not an exception. The Renaissance itself meant a revival of classicism, where the standards of art, thought and culture in general are soaked in the antiquity of Greece and Rome. Therefore, the gaze towards the Mediterranean shores took into account not only the present situation, but also a distant and glorious past. In fact, the inner intentions in the comparison between past and present are what principally dictates the di direction of the English Renaissance and eventually lends to it its unique character. Now, if we pay close attention to the title, we might find that it refers to an English holiday costume, Midsummer Eve, or the night of the summer solstice on June 23, where Englishmen and women would spend the night outdoors around bonfires telling supernatural tales of fairs and witchcraft. It also refers to the Rite of May or Main, a similar English tradition that took place on the first night of May, when young men and women would engage in singing, dancing and possibly more amorous pursuits in the woods outside their towns. However, during the 1530s, the Protestant Reformation took place in England, and with the creation of the National Church there was a change in religious practice, new holiday customs and a total redefinition of supernatural agency. Before that, medieval Catholicism had prohibited fairy belief, because it had seemed like a pagan worship. Believing in fairies, just like believing in witches, became a matter of real debate. Our modern understanding of the supernatural and the fairies differs substantially from that of the Elizabethans. Fairies were beings of ancient and awful aspect, elemental powers, mighty, capricious, cruel and benignant, as nature herself. It was fatal to speak to a fairy. Shakespeare tells in The Merry Wives of Windsor, they are fairies. He that speaks to them shall die. In English and Celtic folklore, fairies are generally depicted as mischievous creatures who come out of night to frolic about the countryside, playing pranks on innocent people. And of course, this is what happens in Shakespeare's play. However, this play attempts to rescue fairies from the medieval idea of them as dangerously mischievous, demonic or evil. Fairies had traditionally been linked with crime, sexual indiscretion, and even violence. Shakespeare deliberately refashioned fairies to deliver them from their traditional sinister associations. Not only does he appear to create a new breed of benevolent fairy, but in his depiction of the pastoral court of Titania and Oberon, he also contributes to the emerging trend of elevating fairies. Titania, who is the fairy queen, refers to another famous work of the period, Edmund Spencer's epic, The Fairy Queen. While the character created by Spencer holds virginity and chastity, Shakespeare turns them all on their head in laughing mockery. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare uses four different actions, four different settings that are connected by the wedding of Duke Theseus and Hippolyta. In this case, what Shakespeare does is that he uses separate settings to introduce distinct groups of characters whose lives and actions are intertwined to create the play's entertaining chaos. The first uh, play is the one with the old lovers, Theseus and Hippolyta. He has conquered her and they're planning and arranging everything to get married. This is like the simplest plot of all because there is not really a conflict. Actually, they end up getting married at the end as they were planning to. The second play is the one with the fairies. Oberon and Titania, they have a conflict in the forest over an Indian boy that Oberon wants to keep. In this case, he uses Bob 
in to trick her and enchant her so he can get the boy. But at the end, they end up reconciled. The third plot is the one with the young lovers. Hermia and Lysander are in love, but she is being forced by her father to marry Demetrius, who loves her as well. Both of them are in love with Hermia. But Helena is in love with Demetrius, who despises her. This is a very common structure in the pastoral novel that influenced the play. However, Shakespeare adds some changes to the setting that this type of novel has, and we're going to be discussing later on. When the conflict is presented, the lovers go to the forest and run away. Helena tells Demetrius about this, so he decides to follow them. Helena follows him as well, thinking she can gain his love, but sadly this doesn't happen. In the forest, Oberon sends Puck to spray a magic potion on Demetrius' eyes, so he will fall in love with Helena. But Puck, by mistake, puts the potion on Lysander, so it's Lysander who suddenly falls in love with Helena. In an attempt to fix the mistake, Puck puts a spell on Demetrius who falls in love with Helena too, and now both of them are completely in love with Helena. Hermia, on the other hand, doesn't understand the confusion and starts a conflict with Helena who thinks she stole Lysander's love, while Helena thinks everyone is playing a very bad joke on her. Demetrius and Lysander in the forest start a conflict over Helena's love, but Puck confuses them all, starting a fog in the forest so they don't really get to fight. When the lovers go to sleep, Puck removes the spell from Lysander so he will stop loving Helena and love Hermia again. Puck keeps the spell on Demetrius so he will continue loving Helena. When the lovers wake up in the morning, they realize they have changed for good, like if everything that happened was just a dream. The lovers are immense in confusion, heartbreaks, switching of loves, friendships restored for good, but at the end they end up getting married. Lysander and Hermia get married and so do Demetrius and Elena. The fourth plot is the world of the Mechanicals. They are planning a play on the tragedy of Pyramus and Tisbe. This is for the royal wedding. They are not professional actors, but anyway they manage to act in front of the old and young lovers. This plot crosses with the fairies world. Since Puck transforms Bottom's head, one of the Mechanicals, into an ass's head, and Titania falls deeply in love with him. At the end, Oberon removes the spell, and that is when they reconcile, but we're going to be discussing Bottom's appearance in these plots later on. All four plots seem to be interconnected with aspects such as love, magic, and comedy. Love and magic, for example, we have different types of love during the play. A love that is put on by magic, a love rejected, a love embraced. In this case, for example, the young lovers, they experiment rejection at some point and their love has changed throughout the play because of the magical events that happen in the forest. Titania and Bottom, for example, she falls in love with him in a love that is unnatural and that is brought by magical events and enchantment. And on the other hand, we have the monarchs that they genuinely love each other since the beginning and they end up getting married at the end of the play. Comedy also finds its way throughout the four plots, even though less with the nobility and more with the lovers and their ups and downs and when they end up being fools of themselves in the forest, also with the fairies and mostly with Puck's figure and his mischiefs as well as the mechanicals that they're turning to actors whenever they're not and they end up giving a very entertaining play for the monarchs. The sleep, my love! <laughs> what? Dead, my dove? <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Also, in act number 5, the scene is used to represent many of important ideas and themes that are evident in the four plots as in the main one. Since the mechanicals are such bumbling actors, their performance satirizes the melodramatic Athenian lovers and gives the play a purely joyful and comedy ending. Pyramus and Thisbe face parental disapproval in the play within a play, just as Hermia and Lysander do. The theme of romantic confusion is reflected as Pyramus mistakenly believes that Thisbe has been killed by the lion. 
just as the Athenian lovers experience intense misery and ups and downs because of the mix-ups caused by the fairies in the forest. The mechanical play is therefore a kind of symbol for a Midsummer Night's Dream itself. The story is hilarious by its comical presentation while involving powerful emotions at the same time. There are also some aspects to consider in the influence of the pastoral novel in the play. Often, pastoral literature is set in nature between forests, trees, woods, where romantic conflicts are usually resolved. Pastoral romance and drama typically present a circular plot in which characters that are usually royal or noble leave their accustomed hounds and spend time in the countryside find comfort in nature so as to effect a change in their state of mind and finally return to a revitalized core. In a midsummer night's dream, the conflict begins in the city, in Athens, where Helena's love is neglected by Demetrius and Hermia is arranged to marry someone she doesn't love. Therefore, they run away to the forest where they can escape the Athenian love, meaning the reality they live on, and be able to love each other without restrictions. However, they arrive to an Athenian non-human forest that is dominated by the supernatural, populated by magical creatures, and where a conflict is already set between the fairy monarchs. This is a contradiction itself from the pastoral set where serenity rules and allows an escape from reality. Indeed, there is an escape from reality, but the nature they arrive to is permeated by magical events, it's a place of confusion, and it's a place where people lose their identities and even their minds. So the human visitors, which are the poor young lovers, and the rude mechanicals that rehearse the play in the forest, they live forever changed by the transgression that occurs there. Indeed, the conflict is resolved because the couples came out of it changed for the good, but only by the intervention of the magical creatures, the fairies.